Our text today is chapter 12 of the book of Judges. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah died and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Today we close the cover on the last chapter of Jephthah's life. There were other men in Israel who led the people to victory in times of peril before Jephthah. There was the left-handed Ehud, for example, and Shamgar, the farm boy. We think of the more familiar figures of Deborah and Barak and the warrior Gideon. And there were the lesser known men, such as Tola, who judged Israel 23 years and Jair for another 22 years with 30 sons helping him in 30 cities. But in every way, the life of Jephthah was different, more difficult by far, and sadder from start to finish. Born to a prostitute who was never a mother to him, and a father who turned his back upon his bastard son. Jephthah grew up without the love and security of a childhood home. His brothers later drove him out for the ugliest of all motives, and the elders of Israel disinherited from him from a place in the land of promise. And having no one and nowhere to turn, Jephthah ran away to the windswept mountains of Tol, and there gathered about him a band of adventure. They became outlaws in their own land, but they gained a reputation for fighting the foes of their people Israel. The story took an unexpected turn when the children of Ammon swept out of the desert, overran all of the rangeland east of Jordan, and oppressed Israel for 18 years. The elders of Israel then went hat in hand to the mountain camp of Jephthah and begged the man to come back and fight for them. In a memorable scene, Jephthah agreed to do so, returned with them, rallied the men to the banners of Israel, and utterly routed the Ammonite army, driving them back into the desert. On his triumphant return home, who should be the first to come out to greet him with timbrels and dancing but his daughter? his only child. Because he had vowed a vow to the Lord and because his daughter agreed wholeheartedly, Jephthah sent her away unmarried to serve at the sanctuary of the Lord all the days of her life. Because God only had been a father to him, his only help and blessing in life Jephthah did not think that he could withhold from God now his best loved and dearest, and he did not do it. But one more trial awaited Jephthah before he laid his armor down. He must have been surprised to see an army approaching from the opposite direction, from the west, from across Jordan. The men of Ephraim had crossed the river and blistered Jephthah with a stinging rebuke. Why did you go forth to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go and fight with you? Which is easy to say when the war is over. What they really wanted was not a larger share of the fighting, but a larger share of the glory. 
and of the spoil. But this was a trait of the tribe of Ephraim. Characteristic of these men from the very beginning. The Ephraimites were descendants of Joseph. The great man of faith who became prime minister of Egypt. And who saved the people of Israel during the years of famine. And so in honor of Joseph. When Israel entered the promised land. They gave the Ephraimites the heartland of Canaan, the choicest and richest land of the country, of scenic beauty, the site of beloved Bible story. Right then at the beginning, the men of Ephraim complained to Joshua said that their allotment was too small, that they, numerous men of Ephraim, desired a, a larger portion. But the old soldier Joshua was an Ephraimite himself, and he answered them in their own words, if you are the important and powerful people you say you are, and if you feel your share is too small, then clear the forests and drive out the Canaanites with their chariots of iron. It's a law of life, Joshua told his brother. You appreciate only what you have fought for. There is no free lunch. The rewards come not to those waiting with their hands out, wanting something for nothing, but to those who are willing to work and struggle and sacrifice. If you don't love it and you won't fight for it, then you can't have it. Joshua bluntly told, you are sons of Joseph, a man of faith. And a person always puts his bravest soldiers in the places of peril and his best soul in the places of danger. You are Joseph's son. Well, maybe they were, but they never filled their father's shoes. For character and courage and faith cannot be inherited. Real greatness does not come by asking favors, but by granting them. Not by being takers of, but by putters in. Not as parasites on the body of society, but, but as productive citizens. Christ Jesus never claimed any honors or rank that was won by others. Jesus never complained that his little corner was too small and his carpenter shop too cramped and the roads of Galilee too narrow and his friends too coarse and incompetent. Jesus laid it down Whosoever would be greatest among you must be servant of all. And so he was, and so he is. And the men of Ephraim kept pulling that stunt through the century. We heard about it not many weeks ago. When Gideon and his 300 had stampeded the armies of Midian, remember? No sooner was the fighting over when Ephraim showed up with a show of force and said, why did you go to fight the Midianites without calling us to fight with you? Gideon played the diplomat with them. 
appease their anger with soft words. Show of humility. What have I ever done compared to you? Gideon told them. And now they're up to their old tricks again with Jephthah. Only Jephthah is not going to play the diplomat with them. Jephthah answers them in the straightforward words of a warrior of God. He says, I and my people were in a great struggle with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not come. And when I saw that you would not help me, I took my life in my own hands. And the Lord gave the armies of Ammon into my hand. And why are you come up this day against me to fight me? Oh, Jephthah told them bluntly they were wrong in two counts. Where were you for 18 years when Ammon oppressed Israel? And then you never heard the battle trumpet call you to arm. And it was not of men, but of faith and of God who gave us the victory this day. Well, that took the men of Ephraim aback. Their blustering had always worked before. But my goodness, it wasn't working at all with Jeff. And so they thought to threaten him. We will burn down your house over your head this day. And did they really think they were so superior? to the mountain men of Jephthah that they turned and said to them, you Gileadites are renegades from Ephraim. You are runaways who have no right to independent action. You have scarcely a right to exist without the permission of Ephraim, much less to fight and win a war without the assistance of Ephraim. If they thought they were going to scare Jephthah, they were sadly and fatally mistaken. Jephthah had been threatened before, and others had made the mistake of thinking he used words because he was weak. They had marched across Jordan like an army with their weapons at the ready. And before they knew it, they were going to have to prove them. Before they could take in what was happening, the battalions of Jephthah came at them from every direction. It was a slaughter, not a battle. And by the time Ephraim realized their mistake, they tried to get back home across the river. But the soldiers of Jephthah had occupied the fords of Jordan and were waiting for them. Every straggler and survivor who tried to cross over that river had to pass a test. They simply asked him, are you an Ephraimite? And if the guy lied, they compelled him to pronounce the word shibboleth, the Hebrew word for river. But in the dialect of Ephraim from the west, they could not pronounce the S-H sound of shibboleth. It kept coming out, sibboleth. 
And that pronunciation gave them away for who they really were. And the 40 and 2,000 Ephraimites who marched out that day in grand assurance never went marching home again. It was a simple test, but it was effective. Even the great soul Simon Peter was caught by it that night in the courtyard of the high priest. His Galilean accent gave him away. American troops in the Pacific Theater used as passwords words which the oriental tongue is near impossible to pronounce. Lots of luck, the American GI said, but on the Japanese tongue it came out, rats of rug. And one day soon, your turn and mine will come to cross that river to get to our real home. The task will be very easy. We know the password, Jesus, Savior, forgiveness, faith. But it's the accent that will give us away. Not so much of the lips as of the heart. Jesus said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord. But they won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. And why not? Because their accent is wrong. There's no harmony between their words and their lives. Oh, they say the right word, but it comes out wrong. Too little in it of sacrifice and serving and saving. And too much in it of self and pride and presumption. Too much in it of what I have and what I know. Too much of the sinking sand and too little of the solid rock, Christ Jesus. Six years, Jephthah led Israel. Then he died and was buried in a town somewhere across Jordan. We do not know the place where he was born. We cannot tell the locale where he lived, and we do not know the site of his burial. He had no father's house to welcome him when he was born. He had no child to cheer him in old age. He lived alone and he died alone. And his Sorrowful and hard life was a type of him who later said, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Did you notice in the text, Jephthah was followed by three more judges, Ibzan, Bethlehem with 30 sons and daughters ruled over Israel and was buried in the family tomb. And Elon of Zebulun was buried with high honors among his people in Agilon. Then comes Abdon, who with his many, many sons led Israel and was laid to rest in the memorial place of his father. All of them, these other judges, we know where they lived and we know where they were buried. They lived honored lives and died in blessing. 
They had large and prosperous families around them. But it is Jephthah's name and not theirs. That is emblazoned on the New Testament role of God's great heroes of faith. Few people have lived a hard and lonely life as Jephthah lived in this world. But it is only in this world. And it is the man Jephthah whom the Holy Spirit chose set down before us all as an example and as an encouragement. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.